Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes here as more people log on. Thank you for your patience. Welcome, welcome. We're just going to hang out for just a bit as more people come on. Thanks for joining us. We'll just wait just a little bit more and then we'll get started. Right, I think uh, I think we can get going here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to James Beard Media Awards at Home, presented by Capital One. Today's event is called Beard on Books: Quarantine Cooking. Uh, if you're like me, we've all been cooking more, and even those of us who cook a lot, I think we've been cooking and maybe even drinking even more than normal. So we're probably all looking for inspiration for flavors and techniques to explore. And I think that our guests today have some thoughts about that. Um, my name is Xiao Cheng Chao, and I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the James Beard Foundation's Book Awards Committee. Um, I'm honored to welcome our guests, Amy Chaplin, Leah Robichek, and Johannes Grabeazis, sorry, Get braises, <laughs> who are all winners from this year's James Beard Awards. And we'll each have about a minute to introduce themselves and then we'll move on to the recipe demos today. Um, one quick note, Chef Johannes, who's the author of the book Ethiopia is in Addis Ababa and could not join us live today, but he did share a pre-recorded demo uh, for one of his favorite peasant dishes called Smooth Shiro. Um, that he likes to serve with injera. So we'll play that tape for you. And then after the demos, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, and first, I'm going to let uh, Amy Chaplin, who's the author of Whole Food Cooking Every Day. And by the way, her first book, At Home in the Whole Food Kitchen, also won a Beard Award. Amy? Hi. Hi, this is my book, Whole Food Cooking Every Day. And I am completely honored to win a second James Beard Award in the Vegetable Focus category. I am an Australian chef and author living in New York. Um, I divide my time between New York City and upstate New York, where I am now. And I'm in quarantine, so I'm cooking a lot. Um, I'm really, I'm really honoured today to be able to share a recipe from my book um, with you all. So I hope you stay tuned. Thank you, Amy. And next we have Leo Robichek, who's the author of the Nomad Cocktail Book, and he joins us now. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Leo Robichek, and I'm the Vice President of Food and Beverage for Sedal Group. So I focus on the Nomad Hotels uh, in New York, LA, in Vegas, as well as the Saguaros, the Line, and uh, um, the net in London, and I am very excited to share a recipe as well today. Um, I know a lot of us have been sitting at home wondering what to do with uh, all of the leftover products that uh, you know may not be the primary ingredients, and I think I have a really cool cocktail recipe for you to enjoy. So That's fantastic, Leo. Now let's meet Chef Johannes. Hi, America. 
First of all, what an honor to be this year's James Beard Award winner in the international category. Congratulations to Jeff, Linda, Judith, and everyone involved in the making of this beautiful book. A special thanks to Kyle and Pete who took the time to discover some of my favorite region. And of course, a very warm thank you to all Ethiopian women who allowed to preserve these culinary assets so that we can continue to enjoy them today. Today I'll be showing you a very simple recipe from the book. It's on page 103. It's called smooth shiro. So shiro is a piece of dish that through time rose to become an Ethiopian identity. Uh, it's a very simple recipe, but at the same time, it's a very tasty one that through my travel I've seen a lot of foreigners really like. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And once we see the process, we'll discuss a bit more about how it's consumed and the history behind it. We're starting off with a very simple um, process of toasting first the chickpea flour with the spices. So this is the cardamom powder, the ajawan, which I think is a very essential uh, spice for Ethiopian cuisine, burger, berberre of course, which is inevitable, which is the, the most important Ethiopian spice, obviously, and um, some nigella, which we usually add to, um, to bread, but also add it to this recipe. So right now what we're going to do is add the flour, toast it a little bit. This is about 65 grams of flour. This will allow you to, to do enough meal for three to four people. So we're gonna toast it for a few seconds. And as soon as we start smelling a nice aroma of toasted flour, then we're gonna start adding the spices and continue toasting it for a few seconds. So we have one tablespoon of There you go, so we have one tablespoon of barbare, which will change the color to a more orange flower, and pretty much add the rest. So this uh, recipe is under uh, the name Smooth Show in the book is a very simple recipe, uh, but one that is friendly for a lot of foreigners who really appreciate this dish. So I figured I'd show you that. Uh, on another note, one of the main reasons I actually wanted to, to show you how uh, Shiro is made is because it's, it's a dish eaten by every class. So this is a peasant dish that ended up being an Ethiopian identity and, and I think it's, a, it's very important to celebrate that. So once we have the flour and the spices mixed and toasted, it's smelling really nice, then we're gonna hit some oil. Any oil would do, any unscented one is preferred. that up and we're gonna basically um, sweat the onion make sure to control the heat to avoid burning it or even caramelizing it we just want it to lose all the humidity that's all we want So in the making of shiro, traditionally there is a lot of wet spices added before it's actually taken to the meal to be powdered. But right now what we're doing is we're sweating the onions, we're adding some um, fresh vegetables so that we can uh, revive some of the spices within the flour and I think it's going to give it a very nice taste rather than just cooking the, the flour. Garlic, ginger, and that's pretty much it. So 
all about controlling the heat. See, we don't need much onion, garlic, and ginger. This is just to revive the taste of uh, the spices, since we're not we're not using any wet spice in the making of this flour. Once we have this, it's just about mixing the flour and the vegetables for a few seconds and avoid coloring it. What we're going to do is right now add some more. The trick in doing a nice show is using the right amount of water as well. Too much will just start making a lot of bubbles and before it cooks, you just get tired of, of spinning it around and um, not cooking it enough. But if you use the, just the right amount of liquid, then the process will be much easier, cleaner, and tastier. So I feel like right now it's a bit thick. So I'll add some more water. Now I have a nice texture. I'm just making sure I don't have any lumps. See, nice orange color. This is what we call in Ethiopia, mit and shuttle. Mit and means balanced. Whereas the white one, the white shiro, which can also be spiced, would be called just nut shiro. Nice, so I'll add just a bit of water again. All the mixture has been done. Now it's just about letting it cook. So it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to cook properly. So to cook means making sure that all the chickpea flour is cooked throughout and that will give something sweet at the end. Uh, just make sure it doesn't taste like flour. That's pretty much it. This is as simple as it gets. And now it's time to let it cook. The show is done. The only thing we're doing now is adding some spiced clarified butter. We're just gonna scent it really nicely and give it that extra buttery um, shine. Oh, it smells so nice. So as you saw, so this is a very simple recipe. The whole trick in making this is just letting uh, the sugar flour cook uh, and cook well. You'd know it's cooked once there's um, um, oil coming out, and uh, we say in Amharic, kabat uh, tafar, means that um, the stew or the shiro just spits all the fat out, and that's how you actually know it's ready. So, once the shiro is ready, we're gonna layer it, we're gonna put it on injera. So, this is what traditional injera looks like. So, you actually find this in the in the book as well, how to prepare this. Keep in mind that uh, we use a traditional um, yeast, just like sourdough, which means um, you'll get better results the more you try it and the more you develop these healthy bacteria within your kitchen. Um, traditionally, we eat and there are layered like this. Several layers was back in the days during the feudal time. Nowadays, uh, it follows more the, the communism region, which brought a lot of ra uh, ration, which means everything was cut like this. So I'm showing you how that's done, so that not to spoil the whole food. And basically, this is it. Beyond the um, the taste factor, I think Ethiopian cuisine has a lot to offer to the world, especially in terms of a lifestyle and how we live with one another. Ethiopian food is consumed around a circular platter where everyone's invited to share and certain human values are um, transcend this and 
and I believe those are respect, uh, caring, sharing. Uh, and this is basically how it's eaten by hand, where we form a gusha, which means a bite. Make sure not to put any on your fingers and voila, my favorite dish. I hope you like this and I really want to thank um, everyone who participated in this and the making of this um, amazing book. I'm truly proud to win um, to have won with the team this award and I hope we'll be back soon. Wow, didn't that look amazing? Uh, the smooth shiro, and that's spelled S-H-I-R-O. Um, and the injera, I'm just imagining the warm flavors of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Johannes. Um, for those of you who joined late, this is James Beard Media Awards at Home presented by Capital One. And I'm Xiaoqing Chow, your moderator. Next, we have Amy Chaplin, who is going to show us the magic of blended vegetables. Amy, take it away. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks again for having me. Um, this is my book, in case you haven't seen it. And today, I'm going to be making um, the, a blended dressing. And these dressings are made out of vegetables. This is um, one of the opening photos just to get an idea of the vibrant colors that you can get from using vegetables in your dressings. And the idea really is not to sneak more vegetables into your meals, but that is a great benefit as well. But it's really for the texture and the flavor and also the vibrant colors. And I really, really love doing sweet corn um, blended as the base um, and you can only use this um, to you know this month or whenever sweet corn is in season because you really really need to get that sweet flavor don't bother doing this um, any other time of year except when you can get this locally and I've got some gorgeous local um, raw sweet corn that I'm going to add to a blender and I'm just going to add all the other ingredients, which are really, really simple. Um, olive oil, six tablespoons. This is um, two cups of corn kernels for about two cups of corn. A quarter of a cup of fresh lime juice. Two scallions. Now, when I do the scallions um, in these blended dressings, I just use the white parts and the light green parts. So just that, it's about three inches. And then save this, um, cut it up fine, keep it in a jar in the fridge and use it over all your other meals, you know, scrambled eggs, grain bowls, beans, whatever. And then just use the lighter parts in the dressing. So I've got two scallions, just the white parts. I'm gonna use a little tiny bit of garlic, not a lot. I really, it, it can overpower when it's raw. So I get a large um, clove of garlic and I just, and the, the recipe, is I just say like a quarter inch slice from a large globe. That's just so you get the right amount. You don't want to have to crush it and then measure it. So I just put that in and then we blend it up. So all the olive oil. Okay. So it does help if you've got a high powered blender, but you can use regular upright blender. Don't do it in a food processor. You really want to get that velvety texture. If you don't have an upright blender, I suggest using the vegetable base. I should explain that the this chapter and the whole book are based on base recipes that can be made in multiple variations. So the dressings like there's sweet corn and you can add, you can just have it plain like this, which is delicious, which is what I'm going to do today. Or you can add fresh basil jalapeno and cilantro or whatever other flavors, some chili, different things that you like. There's a carrot base. There's also a beet base. This is the color of the beetroot base, which is actually blended cooked beets with a bit of cashew butter and similar ingredients, um, olive oil and salt, etc. Actually, I forgot the salt. Just add the salt. It's like three quarters of a teaspoon, approximately. So there's, yeah, the carrot dressing. There's a spicy miso carrot. There's carrot with macadamia and fresh turmeric root. There's all different ones. The, term, um, the, sorry, the zucchini base recipe is really popular because when you have a lot of zucchini, it's like, what do you do with it? You can blend it. And I do mint and cilantro and lime and different flavors there too. So there's just like 
so many variations in this chapter, I can't, you know, go into it now. But it's just a great way to add vibrant color and a creamy texture without dairy and, and or a whole lot of nuts. Some of them have pine nuts. There's a fennel base with pine nuts and Maya lemon that's delicious. But anyway, you'll see how it turns out. So I'm gonna, it's gonna be a bit loud for a little while. really creamy texture. I should just taste it. But it's amazing. Oh my god. When you've got good sweet sweet corn. Look at that. Oh can you see? Yeah so you can see the texture. It's really really creamy. And so if I was to add the other ingredients I just pulse them in at the end. I mean you could add ginger, you could add turmeric. There's so many different ways to go. You can really just use what you have. But all of the bases are also delicious on their own. And I don't really treat these dressings all like, you know, uh, a vinaigrette. Like I don't really pour them over light, very light lettuces, although this would be really delicious. I usually pour them like a drizzle on a taco or with some plain cooked beans. It's delicious today. I ate this with some cooked beets as well because I had a whole lot. Um, some brown rice and some kraut, and it was so delicious. I mean, you can drizzle these over poached eggs. It's really very broad. They're more, you know, they, they're like sauces as well. So anyway, so here it is. Today I'm going to pour this over because it's summer and I feel like now is the time for corn, basil, and tomatoes. I have cut up some different tomatoes, like different colored cherry tomatoes and just plain regular red ones. and you can just drizzle this over, and I'll show you what it looks like. Just drizzle it over like that. And then just top it with, I've got this opal, not opal, is this purple basil pot? It has another name too. Anyway, you can sprinkle this over, and it's really nice with some finely chopped chives if you have those in the garden too and some green basil, it's a really nice leaf. But anyway, it just looks like that. And then you can serve this on the side of whatever you're eating, but um, or you could just eat that whole bowl. It's really, really tasty. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with space for questions. I don't know if that was great. <laughs> well, that, that, that just looks amazing and opened up a whole new world for me. Um, tell us a little bit about why, um, I know, noticed that you didn't, use the greens part of the onions why not the green part well i love eating them i never want people to throw them away i know a lot of recipes say just the white part and then get rid of this i definitely love it but it just changes the color a little bit and can be strong and also depending like now when from the farmer's market you're getting these crazy greens and they're all different so i feel like i can control the flavor you know testing recipes was just better um, but don't use it like chop them up and keep them in your fridge and I just sprinkle them over everything. And I know that um, you you specify that the oil is very important. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what types of oil you can use in this recipe? Well, a good olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, but just not too strong unless you, it, it can compete with the flavors because, you know, sweet corn is pretty delicate, really. It's got a light, sweet flavor. And I feel like a really strong grassy olive oil kind of takes over. Um, you, some of the recipes, I mean, the, the carrot dressing, you could put some toasted sesame oil in there or use sesame, but it's strong. And you need, like, this is six tablespoons in, like, this makes two cups, I think. Um, so you don't want a really, really strong oil. And I'd like, for health reasons, I love pure oils, you know, like cold pressed, extra virgin sesame. There's not that many that I use because you know, I want the really good ones. So 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and um, you know, in your book, you t- <laughs> in your book, you talk about actually um, spending a little bit more on a good extra virgin olive oil because some sometimes the oils are are adulterated. So. Uh, yeah. No, totally. They're refined, they're rancid, they're used all sorts of chemicals in the process of making them. So you really just want as simple as possible and fresh. Like a lot of olive oil that you buy is stale. So, mm-hmm. you know, you really, I mean, I love Bragg's oil. It's like Greek one. I like that. I mean, there's some great ones from California. Just taste taste them and you can use them for different things. I just feel like this one, you just don't want too peppery or grassy for, for this recipe. Uh, could you use a more neutral oil or like a, um, yeah, like a non olive oil? You could. Recommendation? Uh, well, look, the thing is, they're all refined and I'm into whole foods, hence the name of my book. So, so I want the whole food. So, whether it's, you know, sesame oil, I want the unrefined one. You know, it has a more pronounced flavor, but when you use it, you taste it. Um, so, yeah, there's not a lot you can use. Grapeseed oil is refined you know, canola oil. Yeah, there's so many that aren't great. I mean, maybe if you're cooking, use a little bit, but for a dressing, it's a big part of it. So I think you've got to go for the good ones. Makes sense. Makes sense. And are there any um, vegetables or herb combinations that maybe tend not to work well for this type of preparation? Right. I mean, I guess the bases that I stuck with were dressed, I mean, sorry, vegetables that had some body. So carrots, they have like a thickness. Beets, when they, they could be used raw, but they're a bit strong raw. So I cooked the beets. Um, I used in winter, I suggest um, artichoke hearts that are bottled or canned, just plain artichoke hearts, not marinated. And they're a fantastic base because they're creamy and light. Um, And then other ones are like a fennel. It's a bit fibrous, so you do need a high power blender, but that is such an amazing flavor, like with lime, mint, cilantro, it's just together. I sometimes use like in the beet dressing, I use a little bit of um, cashew butter or you could use raw cashews. And that just sort of, it doesn't really add flavor. It just sort of adds body and thickness. But this beet dressing is fantastic with tahini in place of the cashew butter or coconut butter. You can go a whole different way with the coconut. It's really delicious. So you can you can pour this over noodles. In summer, it's so nice over a cold noodle salad or, you know, any vegetable, steamed vegetables. You can just smear it on a plate and then just throw a whole lot of beautifully fresh steamed vegetables on top. And it's a really, it's a really great healthy meal. That's fantastic. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for showing us uh, uh, this corn dressing. And now we are going to move on to Leo, who is going to show us a cocktail. Hello. How's it going? Um, Good. Thank you for that. That was actually amazing. My partner is actually vegan. So this whole quarantine, like many of you, I've been cooking every day at home and I've been actually making mostly vegan recipes. So I'm excited to check out your book. Um, but mentioning sort of at-home bartenders or at-home chefs, um, a lot of my friends have, you know, called me over the last few months and asked me what they can do with the items that they have in their bar. Um, so I wrote the Nomad Cocktail book, um, and this for me was very much a snippet of a moment in our life. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that when I wrote the book that it was a rea- like a true a representation of what we do every day at the Nomad. So in the beginning, there's a little bit of an intro there's a bit about service, but all of the recipes are very much exactly what we do, um, which makes the book a little bit more advanced. Um, that being said, there are some recipes in here that are very easy to make. Um, so the one I chose actually is one of my favorite recipes because it answers both those questions, both what is easy to make and what can I make with all of these items that I don't really know how to use in my bar. So a lot of my friends have been buying a lot of different vermouths. Um, there's tons in the market and um, you know, obviously, everyone knows your sweet vermouth to make a Manhattan. There's dry vermouth that makes a martini. Um, this is a blanc vermouth, which is actually like a sweetened version of a dry vermouth. Um, but a lot of people don't know what to do with these items besides making those core cocktails. So I wanted to take a, a drink uh, that is easy to make, that you don't need a lot of prep for, uh, and that uses these other products that would normally go bad. So I'm not sure if most of you know, but vermouth is actually wine-based. So it does have a shelf life. Um, I would say if it's stored properly, and what do I mean by that? I mean if it's stored with the lid on, 
and if it's stored within the fridge once it's opened, it'll last you for about two months. Um, if it's not stored properly, it'll probably give you about two weeks. So that's if you open it and just leave it out. And if it's, especially if it's in sunlight or if it's in warmer temperatures, it's going to deteriorate pretty quickly. Um, so with, with this cocktail, it's called a Montauk. It's under the classics recipe in the book. So I believe it's page 188 and it's a more obscure classic. It comes from, um, a collection of classics that really were, were made around uh, the late 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And um, it's a classic that uses the inverse recipe of your traditional like martini or Manhattan variation. What do I mean by that? I mean that it has more vermouth than it does base spirit. So this cocktail is sort of like a brother to a martini um, or a cousin to a Negroni. It has a lot of those similar flavors and it's called the Montauk. Um, also uses another ingredient that we never really quite know what to do with, which is Peychaud's bitters. So I'm going to start with six ja uh, dashes of Peychaud's bitters. Um, if you don't have one of these uh, dasher bottles and you're using it from the bottle, there obviously is a difference between the size of the whole of this dasher and the one that the Peychaud's comes with. So if you're using from the Peychaud's bottle, I would do about three dashes. So Then I'm going to use a vermouth that's called Punta Mist, made by Carpano. It's sort of an anomaly when, as vermouths are. It works like a sweet vermouth, but it's a lot more bitter. So uh, this was uh, created by Carpano to commemorate the day that the stock market rose a point and a half. That's why it's called Punta Mes. But they also playfully say that it's like one part vermouth and half a part bitter, so it straddles that line. So it's gonna be more bitter than your traditional ones. So I'm doing about a quarter of an ounce. And then I'm gonna do three quarter ounces of both Dolan Blanc. And Carpano Antica. Then I'm going to do one ounce of a Navy Strength Gin. So this is Hayman's Royal Dock. It's about 57% alcohol. It's only one ounce versus uh, the ounce and, three, ounce and three quarters of the vermouth that we're using. Um, the reason I'm using this is uh, because it does have a higher proof. It's also a lot more viscous and almost a little bit more oily than your traditional gins. So it gives it more body with the vermouth. Uh, but again, this is one of those products that you buy or that you get gifted that you might use it in a tiki cocktail, but you never really know what to do with it again. So uh, why it's one of the reasons that we chose it for this cocktail in particular. So you're gonna combine those four ingredients or five with the Peychaud's. Gonna add some ice and you're gonna stir. Now, one of the questions that I get asked the most is, how many times do you stir? And the reality is there's no answer. It very much depends on the ice, on the ice and the liquid. So if you keep all of your vermouth and your spirits in the fridge and the ice is just coming out of the freezer, you're gonna have to stir a lot longer because in order to get the right dilution, it's gonna take a lot longer because the ingredients are actually colder. Um, in this drink in particular, I'm gonna stir a little bit less because all of the ingredients are at room temperature, the ice is a little bit wet. What I mean by that is that the ice has started to melt a little bit, but also because it, I'm going to put it on the rocks. So that's something that a lot of people uh, need to take into account or that you should take into account when you make a cocktail. If it's going on the rocks, you actually want to stir it less to get less dilution because you're going to get more dilution with the ice in the glass. So just pouring that in a rocks glass with ice. You can also just serve it up. I actually prefer it in the rocks glass because it's it develops uh, as it sort of melts, uh, and then we're going to top it with a lemon twist. So there you go. That's a Montauk cocktail. Are you going to drink that? I can. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us what it tastes like, Leo. <laughs> it literally tastes like a a, a lighter, um, I guess, even more summery Negroni. So you get the bitterness and the citrus peel from the lemon and the bitterness from the Pont de Mes. You also get um, sort of the Venice quality from the sweet vermouth and the Blanc vermouth. And then the gin is definitely there as well. So it balances it out. So if Negroni had uh, a more summery, uh, festive cousin, that would be, you know, your Montauk. Uh, and again, they're all ingredients that are quite delicious. It is a little bit lower in alcohol than your traditional Negroni. So instead of having two or three at home, you could maybe have four or five. Just always drink responsibly from what I hear now. 
So a couple um, quick questions. The yeah. ice cube. So in, mm -hmm. when you go to a cocktail bar, um, they often have different types of cubes, um, go to, you know, a lot of effort to make very nice ice cubes. At home, maybe we have a square ice cube tray or whatever, yeah. but often it's probably just from the refri refrigerator. So tell us a little bit about ice and, and what we can do at sure. home. Make sure. That you we know, sort of, cocktails. Amy was talking a lot about oils and olive oils. And uh, what most people don't realize is that ice uh, provides the dilution for the drink, which is anywhere between a quarter to half of your drink. Um, so the ice does really matter. Um, the flavor of the ice matters. So if you have one of these freezers that's, you know, full of, um, I don't know, chicken and meat that has been there for, for months on end and it has a, a slight aroma to it, your ice is also going to pick up those flavors. So you're never really going to be able to make a good drink. Um, if you do have an ice maker in your fridge, that works out really well. Those ice cubes are actually really good comparatively because they're solid and they're pretty big. Um, so they're really good for shaking or stirring. Um, they are a little oblong in shape, but they work really well. But for me, the most important thing is just honestly looking at your ice and understanding your ice. I know it sounds a little geeky, but if the ice that you have has been sitting out because you're having, you know, two of your friends over, um, and you're social distancing and you're practicing all of, uh, the proper, um, behaviors. Uh, but if they're over and the ice has been sitting out, and it's starting to melt, then you're gonna wanna stir or shake a lot less because you're gonna achieve that level of dilution a lot quicker. But if that ice is coming straight from the freezer and it, I call it almost sticky ice, it's like when you take that ice out and it's not wet at all, it's sticky, it almost sticks to your fingers. It's because it hasn't started transitioning um, from like solid ice to liquid form. So that ice is gonna take a lot longer to cool down the drink and to dilute it than ice that has been sitting out. So you're gonna probably wanna stir that a lot longer. In, in the reality, the only way of telling if a drink is at its uh, perfect dilution is by tasting it. So by taking either a metal straw or a paper straw um, or a plastic, if you're reusing it uh, and tasting it, uh, that's the only way that you can really taste if it's diluted correctly. Um, so if you science do have, of ice. Huh? The science, the science of ice. I know, you know, there's Dave Arnold and uh, writes a lot about uh, ice in his book. Um, uh, my book has a little bit about advice, but that section could definitely be longer. It's actually funny because when my editor was editing it, she made me remove quite a few pages on ice. Um, happy she did because we got more recipes in the book, but um, ice is really important. Um, a lot of people ask about how to make clear ice too. The reality is uh, with our refrigerators, it's almost impossible unless you do a few hacks because our freezers right now um, basically cool in 365 degrees. So if you think about clear ice, the reason it's clear is because it starts freezing only from one area, so usually from the top. So what happens is it pushes all of the air bubbles down. So only that very bottom layer is cloudy because all of it's pushed down. So it's a, the way, like if you think about um, a glacier, or if you think about um, ice, like a frozen lake, that's how that happens. But our freezers freeze 360 degrees, so they push all of that air to the center. And that cloudiness that you see is actually air. So what you can do if you wanna get clear ice at home you can take a small cooler, remove the top, and fill that with ice, and then that'll give you a solid piece of ice that is crystal clear. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so much about ice. That's fantastic. Um, let's see. Are we going to? I think it might be time for our Q and A. Uh, there's Amy. Hi. All right. I wish I had one. Oh my God, my mouth is watering. I mean, that's how we all felt when we were looking at you know, making, I mean, that tomatoes and summer corn, it's all of my favorite ingredients from this season. So, so the for the, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, I was going to say, I was going to invite the audience to post their questions. Um, Cause I, I'm sure we could go on in this mutual appreciation club. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's a couple of things that um, the that came up just in both of your demos is the importance of having the right equipment. So in, yeah. in Amy's case, it's having a high power blender. Um, Leo, we could go on and on about all the different types of tools that you're using. So maybe Amy, talk a little bit about some of the essentials for um you know, using your book, like what, what are the key pieces of equipment that people should have? 
Right. I mean, I like to keep things really simple. I don't like a lot of gadgets and things. So I feel like investing in, you know, a $500 blender, it's a lot. Um, you can use these $80 upright glass ones wearing blender. I've made this dressing in that, so it will actually work. It might smell a bit after making a few of them. They can burn overly. But, um, I mean, besides like a good knife, that doesn't have to be the best, just a good I use a nice a Japanese vegetable knife, but that's the one I like. Um, and pots. I'm more concerned with, you know, a good quality. I mean, you need a couple, but not too many. Just, I don't, you know, I think it's good to wait and get a really good one that you're going to have the rest of your life. And then you don't ever have to buy another one again. I mean, um, stainless steel or cast iron, they're great. And I do use a pressure cooker in my book because you get incredible beans in 18 to 20 minutes, you know, soaked overnight. You can cook chickpeas in 18 minutes and mm -hmm. it's better than anything, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of people who think that you don't, you shouldn't use a pressure cooker because it's not traditional, but I just have such good luck with that. And I eat them plain with a bit of salt and olive oil and they're so good. So a pressure cooker, a good one too, is a couple of hundred dollars. Um, but they have sales, so just look out. I think it's just like slowly collect these. Those three items are my main thing. Anything else is, you know, great to have, but not necessary. Incredible. And Leo, what what would be the essentials for you? Yeah, I mean, I think the essentials are sort of a shaking tin set. Um, a lot of people like the Boston shaker, uh, which is the three piece. I'm sorry, the cobbler shaker, which is the three piece shaker uh, that has you know, the lid with the little cap on it. I'm not as big of a fan on those because they uh, become a little tedious when you try to remove the cap. If you seal the cap, this, if the cap is already sealed when you put the top on, it creates air pressure and it such as it on, so it's almost impossible to take off. So I just like a traditional two-piece shaker. Um, but honestly, the only thing, or the, the biggest thing to me in making cocktails is consistency. So what I invest money in is in measuring tools. Um, so if you're at home and it doesn't really matter, you can use anything to measure as long as you're using that one thing and it's consistent. So uh, in, if you're doing it in proportions, so some people use um, liquid measuring cups or teaspoons or anything along those lines, it's all based on proportions. Um, for me, the things that I invest in is a scale. They're not that expensive, but to make all of the syrups beforehand, I do everything by weight um, because it's really important to get the right or a consistent base product so you can make a consistent cocktail. If you're really geeky, uh, the other thing that I always travel with and that I always bring with me is a refractometer. That's a little bit more expensive. They range anywhere between 80 and $300, but it measures a sugar density. Um, and for me, that's really important when making certain things like, um, like simple syrups that are made out of any fruits um, or like when you're making orgiats or anything that use like a, like a nut milk. Um, and that's because you never know quite uh, the sugar density of the fruit that you're using, depending on the season. So you want to ensure that the sugar level is consistent. Um, so I use a refractometer if you're really geeky. If not, just a scale when you're making simple syrup, just doing, you know, equal volumes by weight really works out well. Um, the other thing is a jigger. Um, I just do it consistently as well. So you can make sure that each cocktail is made consistent every single time. So measuring devices are really important. The rest of the things, like people spend a lot of money on fancy mixing glasses. Um, not to say that they're not important, but they're definitely more for show. You can mix in anything. Like, I, I'm not even joking. My favorite devices to mix with at home because I don't want to go pull out my bar tools is a pork container and a chopstick. And it just works really well. I always have them in my kitchen and then I strain it out. You don't really need anything super fancy. Um, obviously you do need a strainer. Um, yeah, but if, if you're thrifty, you can do anything around the house as long as you're smart about it and you're consistent. But for me, the, the, the biggest tool to have in the kitchen, and you know, it, it would be even for cooking as well or baking, it's just a good scale. And as Amy said, a good knife. A good knife changes prep work from uh, being something that is like tedious and almost impossible to something that's quick and easy and enjoyable. I agree with you there. It looks like we have a question from the audience member related to blending or processing extra virgin olive oil. Um, does it make it bitter? What's your experience, Amy? Um, I have not experienced that. I mean, maybe if you're blending for a long time and it gets hot, which will happen, 
with these high power blenders, the, the, the motors are so powerful, they, they can heat up the soup, you know, like I think people do actually make soups by putting all the raw ingredients in and letting it go for 10 minutes. On that. But that could turn something better if it's a delicate flavored olive oil, but I actually don't have that experience. Um, yeah. I actually saw you touching the side of the blender. I, I assumed it was checking for temperature, but. Yeah, I just thought, I don't know why, I just do that out of habit, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, that, that amount of time, you're not gonna get it hot. Someone did write to me saying they made the beet dressing with warm beets that they just cooked, and I was like, yeah, don't do that, because it does change <laughs> the flavor, you know, of the, the, the other ingredients, yeah, yeah. Looks like we have another question from the audience. Is it a waste to use high-end alcohol in a mixed drink? The short answer to that is definitely not. The long answer to that is uh, it varies. Um, a lot of the really expensive beverages or, or, or uh, spirits, especially when you go on the whiskey front, are very unique and stylized. So they don't always make the best classic version of that cocktail. Um, but both things like um, uh, ABV really matter when you're making a cocktail. So if a recipe calls for a gin that's like 45% alcohol, you shouldn't use something that's 57 or you shouldn't use something that's 40. And if you do, just adjust because it's gonna taste different, obviously. Um, but no, I, I mean, I'm a firm believer of your drink or your, or your dish is only as good as your worst ingredient. Um, where I wouldn't skimp is not even on the alcohol, it's on those initial ingredients. Like somebody will buy a really good spirit or a combination of spirits, but then they'll uh, buy pasteurized lemon or lime juice that obviously tastes very different um, because a lot of those beautiful aromas that you get from the fresh squeezed citrus is gone and it almost becomes more tart and bitter. Um, but again, it's for me, it's not about um, is if it's the, the most expensive, is it the best ingredient? Um, you definitely want something of quality, but you also want something that tastes most similar to that ingredient being used in that recipe. Um, you know, it's the same thing, like you can't quite substitute out one squash for a different squash. You can't quite substitute out, you know, one onion for a different onion. You can in variations, but if there's something that's really hyper seasonal and stylized, like you're not gonna, you're not gonna replace ramps with, you know, a Vidali onion in the same amounts, the same way that you wouldn't do it with, with, you know, a spirit that is a specific proof and one that's, you know, a lot more flavorful or intense or high in alcohol. It looks like we have a quick follow-up on the refractometer. Do you have a specific brand that you... Uh, uh, I don't remember use? the name of the brand, um, but honestly, um, I think PolySci definitely makes one. The most important thing when using a refractometer for uh, for syrups is that you get one that goes from zero to 80. So 50% would mean it's equal parts sugar to water. So it's a 50% dilution of that volume. Most of the refractometers that you buy or that are available on the market usually only go up to 40. You don't want that with cocktail making. That's more for like beer making or when you're making kombucha or anything like that at home. You want something that's going to at least reach to, you know, 60 bricks or 65 bricks because that's where you're going to be at if you're making a two to one simple syrup. Awesome. Looks like the, well, we have one last question and this was for Chef Johannes related to how he made his uh, demo video. And he's not here to answer, but it looks like he probably used um, a cell phone and had uh, another person help him film that. And um, and the kitchen portion looked like it was to me on a on a little tripod or something that that he had. So, all right. Well, we have come to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank Chef Johannes, Chef Amy. Uh, and Chef Leo, I'm going to call you a chef. Um, <laughs> Definitely not a chef, but thank you very much. Congratulations on winning your Beard Awards. We're, thank you. we're so grateful for all your hard work and and um, and your time today. This was fantastic. Our next event for this series is going to be on August 26th at 1:30 p.m. Eastern, and it will be the Walk Therapist. We'll see you now, and this is with Grace Young, who is another one of our award winners. Um, thank you all for joining us for the James Beard Media Awards at Home, presented by Capital One. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for having us. <laughs>